This podcast is part of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed may not represent other podcasts or affiliates of Gunna Geek. Check out more podcasts at GunnaGeek.com and get ready because geekiness starts in 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Our House Legends by High Art and Geek Culture Clyde. This is the movie dude Eric and I'm thankful for all the great movies that came out this year. Hey, we have some good ones. Come on. And this is Kent, and I'm very thankful for uh, every all my friends and family, and also having the uh, shooting script here for this movie in front of me. And this is John o Lobster, and I am thankful for distinctive keychains. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> In this episode, we're discussing The Ice Storm, starring Kevin Klein, Joan Allen, Henry Zerny, Adam Hanbird, Tobey Maguire, Christina Ricci, Jamie Sheridan, Elijah Wood, and Sigourney Weaver, and directed by Ang Lee. Ang Lee, foreshadowing yes. his turn in the Marvel franchise. <laughs> yes. Well, it was a couple of movies after this, and this was... Uh, this was his first American film uh, up to this particular point. Uh, he had done mostly uh, Taiwanese films and a little British uh, uh, four-way into Jane Austen called Sense and Sensibility with uh, Mr. Alan Rickman, uh, who we unfortunately lost earlier this year. Um, hopefully. Do you, think, do you think, though, that like this movie seems really positioned to me because you've got three or four actors in this that are just about to kind of explode. So you had oh yeah, to- Toby Maguire, who was already kind of an up and comer in this kind of circle of films. He was doing movies like this and Wonder Boys and Cider House Rules, but he was just about to explode as Peter Parker, the Amazing Spider Man. Oh wait, not the Amazing Spider Man, just Spider Man. Spider-Man. And you have Elijah Wood, who, again, has had a career up until this point and has been in stuff. But he was a couple, actually two years away from being a hobbit, beca- being a <laughs> hobbit right? He would start yeah. filming the Hobbit or the, the Lord of the Rings Rings. series as Frodo. And I mean, Kevin Klein, Joan Allen, Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. Well, Those... Joan Allen actually was at, at, at a, uh, she was at the, actually beginning her rise at this particular point. Before this film, she was in a, an adaptation of The Crucible, which got her an Oscar nomination. And then she yeah. did this film. And then after this, we had Face Off. And sure. she did uh, a, a, a few other uh, smaller things. And then, of course, uh, when and she we didn't mention the 2000s. And we didn't mention her at the top of the show. Yes, we but did. But... Katie Holmes oh, yes. Yes. in this film was just like, <coughs> I don't know if this was around the time. Was Dawson's Creek already on the nope. air? Or was it this was, like yes. just, it was like oh, just about to hit. Okay. And then her career takes off both in, in TV and film and celebrity gossip. And and then sneaking in once again this month is Alison Janey. Just Alice showing Jane. up right Opening before her career goes. Jamie yeah. Sheridan, we talked yeah. about him in Spotlight. <laughs> Jamie Sheridan. Yeah, Spotlight does a ton of stuff. Uh, really, actually, I think one of the standout performances in this film. Oh, and, we're going to be talking about Jamie Sheridan. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. And later on is the father of Oliver Queen. I don't know how much. Yeah, I think we mentioned that last Randall time. Randall Flag, Come on. Randall Flag, <laughs> sure. And this, yeah, this is just a fun cast. I mean, it's just a well, it's a well cast film. It's a it's an interesting group of actors and you can kind of you can kind of think of this as an actor's movie, but it certainly is a, it certainly is a standout entry, I think, in our holiday. Um, this this again is our is our Thanksgiving film, which there aren't a ton of films yeah. about or set at Thanksgiving, and I think this is kind of fun in that it fills it fills that niche as well for us. Well, We're there are a few out. films that deal with Thanksgiving, <laughs> uh, but mostly I find it very interesting that most Thanksgiving films tend to be dealing with family and family dysfunction. Um, you know, I think w- w- uh, we did uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Right. That was yeah. a travel. 
Well, but that was also about dysfunction because you had a, a, a husband who wasn't there for his family who was desperately trying to get back to them for the holiday. Uh, yet, uh, again, you know, everything was thrown at him so that he couldn't get back to them. Um, but, uh, you know, Katie Holmes was also in another Thanksgiving movie called Pieces of April where uh, she and her mother, uh, played by uh, Patricia Clarkson, I have a very strained relationship, and over this one Thanksgiving, uh, they have to kind of put it, uh, you know, put things to rights, um, which uh, I, it's definitely one of the more indie type films, but very a very unique film. Uh, Holly Hunter did one called Home for the Holidays, which uh, was another Thanksgiving film. And we might actually talk about some of these uh, for other Thanksgiving uh, titles, although. You know, I'm pretty sure that there are others uh, that we're not mentioning yet either. Yeah. But yeah, there there are definitely Thanksgiving films. But I think that considering that this year we do get a new uh, Angley film, uh, which uh, also dealt with Thanksgiving as well, of all things, uh, which was uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk uh, about a soldier. Yeah, it's set who, at a Thanksgiving football game, right? Yes. Um, oh, okay. And uh, I actually just got to see that, and uh, it's a, a very interesting film, and I think it's one I'll be talking about in a, a YouTube vidcast if you want to check that out later on this week. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and let's talk about uh, this particular film. And I think specifically, uh, before we get started, I don't want to bring up, uh, this is actually based on a f- uh, book from Rick Moody. Are you familiar with the book or uh, prior or this film prior to watching it for this podcast? I mean, I knew theoretically that it existed, just like I knew this film theoretically existed. I had not watched this film or read the book prior to, uh, but I I will admit that I kind of selected this film or I suggested it for our rotation, knowing that it was... You did for the was, cast, admit it. Yeah, I did, yeah. I did for the cast, yeah, uh, to, fill, to fill our need for a Thanksgiving holiday film that was also kind of... A drama rather than a comedy. We'll discuss the drama comedy <laughs> relationship to this film. Well, what about you, Ken? Uh, I had not heard about it until Lobster said, "Hey, let's do this movie. It's about Thanksgiving." I'm like, okay. Uh, and I'll be honest here; so. I actually saw this in theaters. Um, okay. This was a, a movie, and it was because of the cast that I saw this movie because I like Kevin Klein. Yeah. I, I loved uh, Christina Ricci and Elijah Wood and Sigourney Weaver. Uh, most of the other actors I wasn't familiar with at the time, and now they are mainstays. Um, but yeah, th- this is a movie I, uh, they played it, the trailers kind of played it as kind of a, a dramedy of sorts. I wasn't expecting it to be as dark or as menacing, uh, as the film kind of came out to be, or at least it, it had that impression when I saw it back in 1997, um, you know, and, and it's one of those that I'm really excited about getting to talk about because uh, this movie, uh, was my real introduction to Ang Lee. I, I had never seen an Ang Lee film prior to this. And since then I have been a huge fan of his work from his Taiwanese work, uh, in Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, which is another one of my all time favorites. Uh, to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which we've talked about. I even like his Hulk uh, and uh, even his more smaller films. And, of course, Life of Pi was my favorite film, I believe, of 2014. Um, So, yeah, I'm a huge fan of of his work. So, let's get dirty. (laughs) (laughs) Time to carve the turkey. (laughs) Well... You know, what what I find interesting, because most films that deal with Thanksgiving, as I mentioned before, do kind of deal with family dysfunction. It's usually some sort of family uh, aspect. And and this is a film that's also a period piece. It's set in 1973, specifically, uh, about uh, two families uh, that are neighbors with one another. Uh, Both have uh, two parents, two kids. Um, And... Out of curiosity, uh, what do you think are uh, kind of the aspects of the holiday or the year that that really kind of sets this movie apart or gives it any kind of prevalence? 
Well, I just want to say 1973 is my actual birth year, so I'm old. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, and I could actually... And, you know, the lifestyle is really didn't hit, but at the same time, I can recognize the parental archetypes, kind of, because this would have been, you know, a few years... I mean, in theory, you know kids might have been conceived at these parties but <laughs> and i'm like these would have been my generation right there oh, yes, and but yeah also, you, yeah but we could also uh, say that this is a very well-to-do neighborhood this, this is, is this is i mean they're sending one of their kids is being sent into new york city to a fancy school but they're yeah. choosing the boy and kind of going yeah, the girl isn't as valuable that she needs well, this level of education. She's in junior high, so I think that's part they could. Of it. I, yeah, I, I bet I, there's I still a private junior high she can go to. But well, and I, I, I kind of feel like she'll be she'll be bound for that pretty soon. Yeah. I, I don't think know. Basically, her dissertation about Watergate. Yes, <laughs> I, I think that there's there's kind of a level of once they're old enough to really send them off to boarding school then they don't have to really deal with right. them anymore. Because for a lot of the movie, I was thinking Tobey Maguire was in college yeah. uh, up until the part where he says, you're only 16. I was like, wait, what? He's yeah. he's at NYU, basically. And you're like, okay, so he's in college. And I, you know, you're trying to figure out the ages of the characters, which they don't give you explicitly. Mm -hmm. So I was like yeah. thinking that Christina Ricci was in high school. And I'm like, nope, okay, she's younger. She's the younger yep. sister. He's 16. She's probably 14. You are so... correct according to the script. Okay, good. So, so <laughs> it just it's funny that you kind of... It, the movie plays, I think, a little bit with your expectations in that arena. That there's not that much physical age between her character, Tobey Maguire's character... Uh, She's Elijah precocious. Woods, I think yeah. Elijah what Woods' character, up. and then um, I think it's Adam Han Bird uh, is the other young boy, right? And he's I'm guessing thirteen. No, he is supposed to be fourteen, and Mikey's supposed okay. to be fifteen, which he does look a lot younger than right. what and the it, script says. He's and that's what I was like. There's it's funny because once I guess once puberty hits, there's a big <laughs> difference hormonally physiologically Between different like you're boys. like yeah. it can be two years a difference of two years and one is a boy and one is essentially a man and so it's really really interesting i think with that that age and obviously they're they're none of them well, at the age of consent hard, but it, it doesn't yeah. help that elijah wood has that uh has that childlike look that <laughs> yeah he has never grown out of even in his 30s at this particular point uh so it is interesting that his younger brother actually looks older than him at times yeah uh, especially when he's in that red jumper um so yeah it's, it's one of those things that and i think that it was intended to be kind of uh, obfuscating to say the least um because another thing i find very interesting is yet uh you know when when you talk about uh uh, Christina Ricci's character, she she's fully developed, you know, as a oh, uh, yeah. as a young uh, as a young girl, um, and of course with that development, she's uh, you know she's definitely uh, wanting to kind of uh, understand and play up her sexuality, right? Which is something that she does throughout the film, because I thought it was very interesting just. And maybe it's also because before this, the last time I saw her, she was Wednesday Adams. And yeah. let's be honest here, uh, there's nothing there that uh, signifies sex. Although, if we did have the Adams Family remake, uh, Wednesday definitely has her mother's uh, physique at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Anyway. Well, do you, do you think that Part of the film, and I was thinking about this too, is part of the film is about the kids acting older than they should and the adults acting younger than they should. 
Is yes, that definitely yeah, playing that's a lot. A good, I mean, yeah. the first time we actually see that is at the dinner party when um, the kids are cleaning off the table and they're taking drinks from everyone's wine glass as they're washing them. Um, again, that's something that um, we don't. You know, it's not something that you would normally see kids doing, um, and I think that that's something that is played up um, in this particular film is that they are smoking pot, they're drinking. Um, they're, it's, uh, trying it's the to, 60s. Yeah. Um, well, no, it's no, this is 1973. It's 73, uh, this yeah. Is, it's the 70s. Uh, yeah. Th- th- this is after the Summer of Love, uh, and, and there, there's definitely still remnants of the, uh, uh of that counterculture, uh, definitely still Right. Uh, prom- Nobody's uh, young enough to be conceived during the Summer of Love. No. no, you know what I mean. No, like, there's like no these four aren't year old, four or five year olds. Right? It's no, interesting it's, it's, that it's, these aren't the summer of love. They they would still be in pampers, right? So these aren't the hippies. These are the beatniks that are now a little bit older and have had kids in high school. Kids they that are in high school the summer and middle of love school. And they're pissed. Right, right. That's that's what I'm saying. Like they kind of they are at the stage where. They have been adults, but now the sexual revolution has kind of trickled down into the mainstream. And or so trickled you up have, if you look at it from a social perspective. Right, trickled yeah. up, sure. So it is now it has now kind of reached them. And they said like the whole key party thing, they're like, Oh, well, this started in California and now it's made its way out to the out to the East, East Coast. Coast. Yeah. Now again, that's not you're not in the age of like the ice bucket challenge where you have something happen somewhere and then go viral worldwide like it's not it's not like that it's it's taken time to kind of work its way across well, that sexual liberation the promiscuity whatever you want to call it has taken its its course and and well, finally you have to reached that connecticut the is, is the hipsters you know the, these are the people who keep up with uh style well, magazines they're, and they're the yuppies I think is the. They're not even term. that. Not this is pre all of those. Well, they've already they've already reached the the, the heights of you know they're not reaching any higher. They're already in the yeah. boardrooms as we see. They're they're not you know yuppie means that they're still upwardly advancing. Um, they've they've reached the pinnacle. They've reached the destination, uh, but they want to stay hip. They want to stay in the know. They want to stay uh, on on the cool side as we see with their fashion. I mean, look, look at all the fashions that we have here. This is stuff that you would not normally see, you know, uh, outside of something yeah. posh, outside of, you know, they're, they're wanting to impress one another <laughs> with how edgy their clothing is. I mean, 70s how, the, fashion. I'm curling into a fetal look position at, over at the, 70s fashion. I mean, oh! I mean, look at the cleavage <laughs> line on Sigourney Weaver's clothes. And, and bear in mind that she okay. is a middle-aged woman. You yeah. know, this is something that you would probably see on a twenty-year-old, and you know, she, and she definitely is playing this up. The, I mean, even the whole key party aspect to it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, this is this is hookup culture, right? This well, is, it's like I said, it's they're they're acting much younger than their age. They're mm-hmm. they're sleeping around. They're drinking yep. too much. They're drinking and drugging, <coughs> and I, I don't know. And they're obviously dressing or behaving. Uh, the the I think the really telling one is when the woman brings her son to the key party. Yeah, which is bizarre. Well, no, what's telling is the guy saying, "Why didn't anybody bring their daughters?" Yeah, yeah, and that's and of that's course like the next super creepy thing because yeah, you're at you're at midlife crisis stage. So once you hit that, you're looking for the younger, the, the which, faster, the flashier. Which aren't these parents what we would call the baby boomers, or are they a little older? Um, I think they're. I think they are the, baby the first boomers because gen baby, the boomers. baby boom happened. They're the first. Just after yeah, they're the first like group. the first round. Which yeah. which tells me that if this is based on the original novel was based on the writer's experience experiences as a child of these kids. Yeah, mm-hmm. boomers need to be quiet about whenever they slam <laughs> on millennials or Gen X. Whenever they go, oh, all you guys think about is blah 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 blah. Oh, really? <laughs> I have this book and this movie you should look at. Well, that we had the same thing with the Graduate for crying out loud. Yes, 
I mean, let's be honest. I mean, the, yeah. the thing is, is that uh, uh, boomers and millennial, and you have to understand there, there's the Gen X, which is in between yeah, the boomers. Which is and, me. I yes. am Gen X. And yeah. the, the other day we got some baby boomer was blaming us for stuff millennials are doing. And I'm like, oh, no, you don't. This is your fault. Anyway. <laughs> no, it, it was, oh, you guys are giving well, them all the trophies. Well, you bring up something interesting, which is like, blame. Because yeah. one yes. one generation blames the other, you know. You know, you're blame. You you know, you're the reason why I can't have fun. You're the reason He's why in, my yeah. life sucks. I mean, and you could put that with any either of the generations, and they, they would say yep. it about the other. And well, the, the parents are going off and doing stuff, and kind of just letting the kids do whatever. It right. Seems. There's well, also a, the a zero supervision. I, mean, I know. And then they judge them. And the only the only reason, for instance, Kevin Klein catches Christina oh, yeah. Ricci being dry humped by Elijah Wood while wearing a Nixon mask. And the only reason he catches <laughs> her just, it's because is because he's fucking the mother. <laughs> yes, he's there and she, I guess, decided, like ran off in yeah. in kind of the middle of afternoon delight <coughs> and disappeared. Well, and he just afternoon delight. Yeah, before, before it happened. and he just sat there drinking vodka on the waterbed. And then, I, I, I don't know. No, he was, and she, he, does, he was, she, she just doesn't point and go, drinking what vodka. do you do? I think what so, is, yeah. yeah. Goofing off on the waterbed. She, it's like, what are you doing here, Dad? I mean, really? No, yeah, she doesn't like, even ask that. I'm re- yeah, yeah, no, she knows. She should have. Well, I'm returning yeah. that no, mug she... that so-and-so, oh, the mustache mug, yeah. You know the mug that got returned like a week ago, I'm okay. sure. No, that's uh, Joan <laughs> Allen that thinks that. Uh, the, Christina Ricci is more yeah. just like she got caught and she isn't thinking. I mean, she could, but the thing was is that she... She, she doesn't care. That, that she's still, yeah, she doesn't care. No, she does care it, because we definitely see how she treats both of the boys. Uh, she, you know, the thing is, is that she's trying to figure out stuff for herself. It, the, she plays that she doesn't care. She tries her hardest to not care, but she does care, as we as we see later on in the actual ice storm. You know, she does have you know she she does have feelings for. Uh, uh, for one of the boys and yet at the same time she believes that she should have feelings for the other um which again is kind of interesting considering again their ages but yeah. uh, the thing is is uh, that we bring up sex and sex plays a large part in this film everyone is trying to uh get sex from somebody uh out of curiosity uh what is it that do you think that these characters are looking for in sex or with the people that they're trying to have sex with they're trying to feel something yeah they I think are the, I they think are the inured. older ones are yeah the older I'm, ones I'm are afraid. trying to feel something the younger ones are trying to feel something that isn't just the older are trying to uh, feel something that they lost in the ones yeah. that, uh, in the young generation i don't know even that something. they lost maybe that they never had maybe something they think they no. had no because but, i think they Kevin had Kyle it and they lost it with, with his wife and but we but the, the same i mean as soon as it's over he's going back over to sigourney weaver yeah right yeah. i mean the thing is is that they're it's not it's that there. they're it's not that they're exclusively unfaithful that you know they'll yeah. yeah. Well, I don't she know. seems to be more monogamous than he is. Well, um, okay. Well, Joan once... Allen does the minister um, of the no. hippie church. No, she, the, she. I don't think she actually does them. No, she doesn't. At any point. She, she does. doesn't. No, no. Well, she, does. Where? Where? she wants to, oh, but I don't okay. think she does. I thought I thought there was a scene with them. No, no they just talk because and you have the scene at the at the book fair uh, and yeah. he's kind of feeling her out and she's kind of like weirded out and then she meets him at the key club and he talks about how the minister wants to feel the comfort of the sheep and she's i'm gonna hope i'm gonna really try not to. yeah, yeah the metaphor there's yeah, some bad metaphors metaphor. in this movie uh <laughs> there's some disturbing metaphors and visuals but uh but that's the humor of this movie there's yeah there's some dark humor going on here some that's actually well, a okay more so lighter. is so i think i think the central i think the central point stands which is the parents the adults want to live go back to their younger days their glory days do you think this is kind of an adult version of freaky friday mm. 
Yeah, except the lightning here comes at the end instead of the beginning. <laughs> Ouch. Hey, okay. <sighs> there's a reason you set, why I brought you up that You set that one up. You set yes, that one up. Yes, I did set that up, there... and I did it purposely, yes. Well, I want to point I out think... it's not lightning that kills. Right, 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 the, yes, the electrocution, but... sure. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> But I think the kids in this are so beset upon all sides by whether it's Watergate, whether it's their parents' own dysfunction, whether it's their classmates' dysfunction, their roommates' dysfunction. They're, they're kind of all tr- also trying to feel something that isn't the world around them. Um, I think Toby or uh, Elijah Wood sums it up best when he says molecules and he's talking about the molecules and how the molecules, oh, that's true. You have to taste everything. And then the reason he goes out in the ice storm is he wants to taste things without the molecules. It'll be clean. It'll be pure. And he won't have like the taint of everything going on around him out there everything as well. Is, everything well, well, is I mean, frozen. There, there's because, two scenes where he talks yeah. about purity. Uh, the first was when he's talking about geometry and how everything is in your head it and it's pure happen. and it's perfect yeah space yeah. and so the thing is is that he definitely comes off as someone that's um looking for something pure something that isn't hindered by past or or, or uh, conditions because let's be honest here look at his parents one is barely there um either emotionally or physically at times i, I love the fact that when the dad comes home and he says i'm home and, and and it was Elijah Wood that says you were gone, uh, and he's not doing it to be mean. He's just like I didn't even realize you not you know you weren't here. Yeah, he's so he's so little of a presence in their lives yeah. that the fact that he's gone doesn't even register. But I think it's also interesting that we the film itself starts off with a discussion on the Fantastic Four. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> well, and, which is family. Which is, it's, it's okay. So it's a family this movie gets what three Fantastic Four movies <laughs> Did have not failed get. to grasp in its opening sentence or its opening monologue, yes. which is that the Fantastic Four is about family. That makes them different than every other superhero team. So this and that's is why the you... best Fantastic Four movie yet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Ang Lee yes, did the best know. Fantastic Four movie. <laughs> but also, I think it's also interesting to say I did watch the... Uh, uh, Criterion version of the Ice Storm with the Angley commentary from 2007, and it is funny that uh, Angley did also bring up that uh, Fox really needed to make a better Fantastic Four movie. Right, and this is coming uh, four years after his own Hulk movie. Sure, um, and so. I think it's I think there's something there's something to that because that would have been a fairly current issue of the Fantastic Four at that time, right? Like. I know this is a period piece. So I that think so. That would have been a fairly yeah. recent issue that would um, have come no, out. Actually, I believe that, that uh, if I'm not correct, that is actually one that came from 1973. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. like it would have been. Oh, I'm sorry. Today, meant, today <coughs> it would have been a vintage issue. Yeah, but today it would have been a vintage issue. But or probably when the movie Im- was made. Probably important to the original writer in some way. Right. The script so, I mean, actually has all that. And it's in a it, good so. and it's a good metaphor. Like the Fantastic Four, I think works in this sense. And if I, I guess if you're going to have a comic book that that mm-hmm. is the the thing for them to talk about, that kind of makes sense. I wish, and again, yes, I I do wish that that future Fantastic Four writers and directors had kind of gotten the, the a hold of that um maybe so sooner. if they ever decide to reboot fantastic four uh you'll send them the ice storm it's like hey look at this i think it's re- yes. <laughs> i think it's required watching i think like that's what i don't i don't really feel that any any fantastic four director or script writer I, I don't think that they've gotten the family aspect right. I don't think they've gotten it down. And and I and I'll almost say like you could give the Roger Corman movie that. Like it kind of understood that part yeah. like that yeah. dynamic of the Fantastic Another Four. There's an awesome is... documentary that you can check out now called Doomed, mm-hmm. which is the the untold story of the the 
the hidden Fantastic Four movie. Oh, yeah. the one from the uh, the, the one from men. the early '90s. Yeah, that yeah. was made just to keep the rights and then promptly buried. Yes. Yeah. Another interesting thing is, is that the, the Fantastic Four speech actually plays as foreshadowing because if you look at it from a time linear perspective, what he, the the panel he's looking at happens around the exact same time as Mikey's fate. Yes. Um, that ha- about as, yeah. I I, th- I thought that was extremely interesting. That you know that ha- most of this movie is done in flashback. Uh, we're actually seeing the end of the film. Uh, before we right. get to the As beginning, the first scene. And we go yeah. back and we find out what happened up to this point. And that's how I tried to figure out who was going to die because I knew someone was going to die and I was playing the game of who's it going to be when you know... Well, you know these, four of yeah. them aren't going to. Because yeah, I know. I was like, these well, yeah. four characters are still alive well, and clearly something you, has happened. As a side note, since we know Mikey died... Do we think, uh, you know, back in that apartment, that there wasn't an overdose going on? Oh no, no, no! That was my that was my backup plan. So my uh, first one was that Mikey is clearly going to get himself killed, killed. When, he, when he goes yeah. out into the storm, and my second one was they're going to be she there. was going to OD. Yeah, they're yeah. they're both going to OD, and they're going to be like, we just got a call from New York. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But I, I thought it was interesting that they don't ever men- they, they mentioned that the meds are like five years out of date or something. Five months. And, oh, which five months. It, five months is not the, bad, but I wouldn't recommend it. But I know the thing was is that uh, uh, when they brought up, I, I had the "Dumb Ways to Die" song st- uh, stuck <laughs> in my head. Dumb uh, ways to die. Although I think okay. half of the ha- half of this. Uh, cast seems to be playing the dumb ways to die. Because <laughs> <Did I? laughs> uh, how many hey, times this did is, they just tempt death? This is the seventies. There's no STDs. <laughs> Not just STDs, but I mean, you know, driving on icy roads. Oh yeah, I can't believe. Yeah, they. Who this, has a key party over Thanksgiving weekend for one? Yeah. And two, when all your family's in town. When uh, yeah, and two, is, you should look outside no, and go, bring, "Oh crap, this is bad." Maybe this we is, should uh, skip this. Maybe we can reschedule can this for tomorrow. you bring Grandma, Grandpa, Aunt Esther? Yep. Come on. I mean, sure. make it a bring family thing. <coughs> yep. Let Uncle me get Tony. my teeth. Oh, God. This yeah, is, come on. This is, just to get the, the timeline right, this is Friday that this happened, No, right? uh, the, no, no. This was Thursday. This was, the ice, uh, there's this thing the ice storm is Friday night. Okay, is no, it? well, it's Thursday going into Friday because they had Thanksgiving uh, dinner during the day, and then he's going back up to uh, he's going to go up to uh, New York that night. Um, and, and then they the pick him up in the morning, Friday. Everyone, uh, because they're putting away uh, Thanksgiving. Okay. No, yeah, actually, I'm sorry. I thought he said the party was Friday night, but I yeah, guess. I kind of thought he said his date was Friday. Yeah, I I, I thought it was uh, Thursday because he be said wrong. the date was I mean, Friday, uh, but it, I. It, I I thought it was kind of all over a twenty-four hour period, but it is a sh- it is a rapid yeah period it is that and it isn't kind of yeah it it's you get Monday I think it starts on a Monday and ends on a Friday but I I could yeah. be totally wrong Kent you have the script feel free to yeah. back us up or, or I I'm not us. sure if it quite but covers my, the last couple my kind of my point are, being is uh, that like like you said this is a this is like an encyclopedia of like bad decisions that get made by everyone. Cause you have adultery, you've got partner swapping, you've got underage drinking, underage sex, drug, u- drug use, drug abuse, mixing alcohol and drugs, driving under unsafe conditions, walking under unsafe conditions, jumping on a diving board that's covered in ice over an empty <laughs> swimming this is pool. Half of that's why I thought he died. This cinema right here. Like, like uh, it's almost like a Final Destination. Like I got a Final oh, yeah. Destination vibe. Like if you go into it knowing that tragedy will strike, and I think the blurb on the Blu-ray or the DVD says, "Oh yeah, everything's great until tragedy strikes and close to their family." I'm I, like, okay, somebody's gonna die or or, or get messed up. So I can't wait for what's you to watch a be? Whit Stillman or a Noah Baumbach film. Uh, you know any of these kind of Woody Allen light types because this is all that you get. You know, it's basically upper, uh, rich, bored, upper oh, yeah. middle class, uh, 
Sure, I've seen the squid are, and the whale. I get it. They can't, you know, the, 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 all, all they can think about is just imp, you know, poor impulse control and way too much money and not a care in the world. That's pretty much what most of these are. Um, hell, even Woody Allen goes into this in most of his 80s stuff pri- uh, primarily. You know, just a lot of bored people who just ha- you know, just don't care. They don't care. Uh, you know, they, they, it's almost kind of uh, Marquis de Sade-ish at, at points, you know, where, you know, that they, they, they're willing to sacrifice themselves and their bodily, uh, you know, and, and, and risk bodily harm uh, for pleasure, which they may or may not even ca- really get anything out of. Uh, it, it's kind of weird in that particular sense. And it's one of the reasons why I have a hard time with many of these films caring about the characters because you know they don't care about themselves why should i care about them either and where with this particular film it has an ace up its sleeve which is that you have kids who don't know better and that right. we kind of, that we really don't want to or, see them fall or into also the same kind of do, kind of do know better because we know that someone's body is a temple and you shouldn't <laughs> go messing around yeah. oh come on you, would you would you oh, buy God, that the, bullshit the hip- you know, it, from, I think from, there, the the hypocrisy of the parents ca- yeah, depends that's, on that's the kids the not knowing yeah. what's going on, or the and the kids kind of know, but they just I mean, did they're you not, look at all they're not yeah, willing to throw it at them. Hypocrisy it, is a good point. You're right. I think to uh, bring I mean, that did up. Did you and, notice all those books that were in the book sale at the library? You know. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I <laughs> that's what I was trying to make the point earlier about. The sexual revolution, the this is has filtered up. into yeah. pop culture. Mm-hmm. So you have this. This is you know, now like ev- ev- everyone's read it. They've passed it around and they've put it in the the church uh, book sale bin. No, no, no. It's library, well, library. No, that's okay, right. but fair enough. I'm, like it's yeah. it's now not um, it's not controversial, right? These aren't. This is not a book that you're going to hide under your bed. This no, is a book that you're going to put, put on the coffee table. Yeah, edgy is the norm. I mean, again, they're all, they're all trying to compete against one another about who's the edgiest. Right. I mean, what what, what do you a, think is the, the deal the key about party. the they're key party? Yeah. I mean, Sex. that's that's the whole point yeah. of the key party is to be edgy. It's to be hipper than the squares, you know, in the well, next town the, over. Instead of just this, yeah, this they film could. comes at a great time. <clears throat> In the 90s, where you're going through the Clinton scandals, you're going through the moral yeah. panics about rainbow parties and jelly bracelets oh. and things like that. You mean the made and, up shit? Right, sure. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But this is this is kind of like the same time period. And <clears throat> you're also seeing like a revisitation of these um, these sexual tensions uh, in the 1990s. So this, I, I think it's a great, it's a great use of a period piece in the time period that the movie is made as well. Well, I mean, 73 is considered a down period in American history. You know, it was the Watergate scandal. Yeah. It was the, uh, the, you know, the end of the Vietnam war. Um, it was, it was not exactly the best time. And especially for Thanksgiving, the, you know the the holiday that uh, should be about what you're thankful for. Is there anything that these people are thankful for? Do you see anything that they would, uh, especially given uh, uh, Christine Ricci's uh, uh, thank uh, blessing? Oh yeah, or uh, her rant, uh, political rant about everything. But, yeah. Well, I think uh, Kevin Klein's character is thankful that he could sneak over to Sigourney Weaver, but, uh, <laughs> and but that's about that, it. He's not really getting anything out of, because what he's really looking for is a connection, which she doesn't want to give him. But she refuses. Yeah, when she's like, well, he... I already have let's, one. Let's husband. face it. He's, for another. Let's face it. He can be boring. They finish up sex, and what's he talk about? Golf. Like, well, he's looking for a connection. No. He's yeah. he thinks that he, the thing is is he's is, he's looking for someone that'll actually listen to him because it's, it's clear that his that 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 Joan Allen isn't listening yeah. to him. She really doesn't. Well, and I think Joan Allen, for what it's worth, is going through her own stuff yes. at this time. She's trying to get 
in touch with her youth again. You see her take the bike yeah. ride. She gets the bike out of the shed. She you know, goes, you never really forget. She goes shoplifting like her teenage like daughter. Like her daughter, like mother, like daughter. Except her daughter's uh, much better at it. Yeah, she gets caught. Yeah. She gets greedy. Well, if you also notice, uh, it's also like uh, father, like son, where both are sneaking through someone else's medicine cabinet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, and then he's trying to explain masturbation to him, and it's like, dude, your son is trying to get laid. Don't do it in the shower. Just, yeah. Because, it's like, know, wait, because everyone know everyone everyone assumes you're doing it anyway. Yeah. yeah like, in, in, that's uh, my favorite uh, argument. <laughs> But one one thing I have to admire about what Kevin Klein is doing with this character is he really is trying to be a good dad. He, the thing is, he just doesn't know how. He is, you know, he's trying to give, uh, you know, he's he's trying to give advice to his son. He's trying to give comfort to his daughter, and for the most part, he, you know, he, he just. He can't see outside of himself. None of these characters really can see outside of themselves, right? They they're all kind of. Uh, wrapped up in, in their own misery, their own uh, wants, that they don't realize just how much they're hurting each other, right? No, no, I'll say Allison Jamie's character can see outside herself because she hosted the key party, so she bur- <laughs> she's trying to bring happiness, and that is a lame argument, but I'll stand by it because she's no. the only one who possibly I, can be argued that. I think it's... <laughs> you, you have this thing, though, where... They're all consenting adults, with maybe right. the exception of the lady who brings her son. Uh, but one he could be eight. He, he could be eighteen. Yeah. We don't one know. Presumes he's yeah. So they're all consenting adults. This is there's the period definitely, of Roman Polanski. Let's put it that there's, way. There's some one would assume peer pressure, but it's very it's very tame. Like put your keys in the bowl. Don't put your keys in the bowl. You ready? You ready to go? Well, yeah. Voluntary. We're going to do, we're right. going to do it at the end of the night after everyone else has left. It's not going to be like awkward for people. Um, you pull your spouse's keys out. Fine. You guys can just go home together. It's fine. It's all good. And one thing I really love about this, we're not talking about very sexy people. This is no. very middle age. This it's is your, it's your friends and neighbors. Yep. You know everybody at that party because yeah. you have common friends, or you're you're on the PTA together. You're on the school yeah. board. You do the, <coughs> the rotary, the, the whatever. You know this. Your church, your library, your yeah, and it's whatever. And and it's kind of like the um, the seven minutes in heaven where you're you know you're in the closet yeah. for. How long? And yeah. you're just in the closet. Like there's no. no it's that's just who you go home of with. Aggravating hell going on icy roads that <laughs> lead to a certain death. Um, I think it was implied that everyone was going to spend the night there, but I don't know. No, no. Exactly. I think some people they, they could. Say, like, like who's could. staying? But, yeah, yeah. Don't please do not go out on those roads. Having yeah. driven in conditions like that, and the cars see. of that era were not. No. Horribly well designed. Unsafe to deal at with any that. speed. <sighs> As we see when, you know, uh, Jamie Sheridan's car just careens off of the road, um, leaving them kind of stranded. Although I, I have to say, um, I, I love how we build up to the key party. I, I love how uh, basically Joan Allen kind of catches Kevin Klein in the lie about the coffee mug. Yeah. And how, the, you know, there's a question about going to this particular party. Uh, when they find out about the key party, you know, it's like she's the one who decides to go ahead and do it because, you know, why not? You know, and on top of that, she finds out who he's been sleeping with. Uh, uh, I, I love the fact that he gets too drunk to be able to do this. And that it ultimately comes down to her and Jamie Sheridan. And, and I'm going to say right now, the scenes with Joan Allen and Jamie Sheridan are probably some of my favorite in the film. Um, because you could just tell the pain and the sadness and the frustration. Uh, yeah. um, and, and that sex scene is so unsexy and so sad. That is the most, that is the saddest sex scene <laughs> yeah. in a movie. Probably since um, what's his name had sex with a pie. That's or not I guess this sad. That's just awkward. Uh, but it's this is great. I love Jamie Sheridan. 
as an actor. Um, I'm kind of confused why Henry Zerny's character gets because billing. Kevin Klein and Henry, okay, uh, well Henry Zerny, Zerny um, he's a bigger name at this particular point. Uh, he was in a few uh, Canadian productions, and he was also in Clear and Present Danger. And with he was Harrison just Ford. in Mission Impossible, I think, right before this. Yes, he he played Kittredge. Um, I don't, I don't. I'm like his character really isn't a factor in the film. If you look at, if you look at who gets top billing in the cast, he's the only one that's not a member of that family. Well, and I guess David Crumholtz. Well, but, well, the David Crumholtz isn't either, but the one thing that Henry Zerny's character, I, I think, is pretty interesting because he is the outsider, right? He is Kevin Klein's rival in business. Um, he is kind of everything that Kevin Klein isn't, or that, that Kevin Klein mm-hmm. wishes that he was. He has the charisma. He has. He knows exactly what to say. Uh, he's always fair game for practically everything. And, well, literally everything, because who does he go home with? Yeah, we were all thinking it, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Well, all right, see you later, gents. I'm yeah. off, ladies. Jeez. Have a good. I bid you good evening. Better but, go." But it, the thing is, is that you know, but but he but he is you know, we, we get the sense that there's genuine jealousy of Henry Zerny for Kev, uh, that Kevin Klein feels uh, in this entire film, and so when he shows up at this party and he's showing. You know, he's showing up uh, Kevin Klein. He, he, everything yeah. he does, he becomes the life of the party. You know, everyone's kind of interested in him. He, you know, he has, he makes friends very easily. And, you know, Kevin Klein is resulted to drinking <laughs> because he's getting nowhere. He is miserable. Right? Yeah. <coughs> uh, that whole party was weird. So. Yeah. And it was kind of hard to follow in the script because they edited the end of the script. Fl- some of those scenes are flipped from what the script was to what it finally showed up on the screen. Because mm-hmm. Mikey, when he goes out, they kind of, in the script, all of those scenes of Mikey are like, contig- right in a row. And uh, here it's one... spliced in, and I think it works a lot better spliced in like that. Well, where. I... I, I, I anyway. like how all three of these stories converge. Um, yeah. I, I will say one thing, though. I was kind of expecting there to be a Tobey Maguire, a Katie Holmes, a David Crumholtz three-way going on. Um, <laughs> come on. They were they were setting that up, right? Yeah. I, mean, I was like, I, I can <sighs> definitely see there being some sexual tension. Of course, uh, also interesting is that uh, Kevin Klein and Henry Zerny have this kind of rivalry between each other, and David Crumholtz and Tobey Maguire mm. have a rivalry. Um, the foil. Oh. So just have a bunch of freeways going on in this yeah. movie, and it would have <laughs> lots of orgies. Well, and yeah, and I guess I guess the the other thing. I mean, of... it would be the... weird, but the brothers with. Yeah, you know, the other like thing to kind of Christina Ricci, but say about well, that being, no, because you couldn't do that on it. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not even that because let's be honest here. Well, the thing is, is that with the Christina Ricci part, yeah, we could tell uh, with the airplane model of you know the the explosions, well, right? Yeah, uh, the Christina Ricci actually has a connection towards the younger brother. That is really her connection. Uh, she feels that she should be because of by age. Uh, be interested in the Elijah Wood character, but let's be honest here, he is completely uh, distant. He, yeah. the, the, he is uh, not... Uh, he's, would, yeah, he's do in you himself. Think, do you think he's uh, slightly autistic? In, in a modern sense, he'd be on yeah, the autism I took that. I took scale. that to also... His, his parents would have had him on medication if he well, were... Well, hold on a second, because I kind of took that cack as well when there's a scene where um, Jamie Sheridan's character makes a comment about his son being a lot like he is. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I can kind of see that because I mean, that it wasn't diagnosed at this point and certainly someone from right. Jamie Sheridan's generation wouldn't have been diagnosed and you were just you know, like awkward or, but or then when uh, Mikey you know, dies, difficult. I, mean, you I see guess all is... the emotion coming out of. Oh, they're very Jamie close. Sharon. 
they're very close but there's also sort of they both have a little bit of awkwardness about them i think that and the they, fact that and the fact that they not autism well and they're it both be, very though. focused on their like the technical aspects of their work like he's all excited about the about silicon which is something made from sand Mm-hmm. And like he he gets really into that, and we find out that that's why Henry Zerny is interested in him because he's making these pioneer these pioneering advances in the materials that he's dealing with. And uh, Elijah Wood's character is very preoccupied with the theoretical and molecules and things like yeah. that. He doesn't really relate to the world in but he's not a really good emotional student, as we find out. He's, well, that's also yeah. not disqualifying. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, but at the same time, uh, you know, Jamie Sheridan's character is on the co- on the brink of advancements. You know, he is uh, distinguished. He is distinguishing himself uh, both in business and science. Where uh, his son is he has an interest, but that interest is theoretical. Uh, you know, it, yeah. it's not. You know, it's it's. How do I put it? It's it's kind of like the the T.J. Miller character in Big Hero Six, uh, where you know, yeah, he loves the science, but he can't do science to save his life. Uh, you know that, that it's basically just fanboying, right? Well, there's plenty of and yes, I did in, bring up Big Hero Six to explain yeah. the ice storm. <laughs> there's there's plenty of instances where you have somebody who was not a very good student when they were young, when they grow up, they're basically low level C. Yeah, I don't so. think I don't think Einstein was yeah. a good student necessarily, yeah. but he found what he was good at or found a way to yeah. access it was a good the conductor. information. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I hello. I think there's an argument that you can make that maybe these characters are if not on the spectrum that they they do kind of represent Non, non-traditional types of characters in film. And I think that, that that connects well with the general dissonance that you have. Like everyone in the cast, and I think this is kind of core to the movie or, or core to the story, probably in the book as well, that everyone is struggling to relate to the world around them. They're, they're struggling to find what it is that makes them feel whole. Uh-huh. And whether it's Toby Maguire's character who just wants a girl and I guess is well, and I and I guess kind of you got to give him a little bit of credit. He does come up with a good plan. It is not yes. a, like not a nice plan, but he's going to He's going to slip <clears throat> slip his, you know, not slip the girl a Mickey, but slip the rival a Mickey, Mickey mm-hmm. yeah. to get him out of the way. And then once the girl ends up taking one, too, and falls asleep with her head right in, his in his lap, I'm like, OK, <laughs> yeah. let's let's not do this. And he doesn't. Mm-hmm. He he lays her down semi gently and gets out of there well, because he's a romantic, just like his dad. Uh, well, he's, he's a romantic, and yeah. he also doesn't want to be implicated in well, two in the, potential overdoses. Oh, well, in the shooting script, he calls up uh, his sister before he leaves, and basically asks her, "What should what should I do?" Because he's thinking about doing something wrong. Yeah. Well, or, I mean, you can tell he, he's thinking yeah. about it. But well, the of course yeah. he's thinking about it. I mean, he's and not. Then, I mean, it's the object of his affection is literally fallen in his lap. She's just not <laughs> conscious, and you know, so he's it, like, "Well, it's the mo- it's that moment yeah. of truth. It's that you know that, that the moment, moment of that, temptation." Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's that thing where you know he, you know, is he going to be the you know be the uh, the man that he should be, or will he just give in to his weakness? And again, this also does. Is he going to be a hero? Uh, comic book reference. Mm. Yeah. I'm still. No, I think he's already not a hero by drugging them. 
but but no, hey, but no, they, drugs don't make no right. he didn't he i will say he didn't drug them they drug themselves he said hey this is exactly what this is no and he i'm putting Krumholtz. it here and Krumholtz didn't know that he mickeyed him it was um uh, uh, it was Katie Holmes that actively yeah. took yeah, the Yeah, and, and he was like, no, maybe you should just take half. No, 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 come on. You you got it out of the shelf. Yeah, you break it, you, you took buy it. You took it down off the shelf. Here we go. But, no, the, the, the thing is, though, is that, you know, the, 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 in a way, he becomes better than his father in this scene because his father is weak. His father is, you know, he, he you know, who can't say no. Um here he does he he actively says he he actively makes the decision um that he is not going to do this and um and then of course he runs like hell for the train that he's about to miss yeah uh that he's going to spend is he a little night on all night in the fucking train is is that that even a thing i'm not from the north uh from the north so i i i Really, uh, there are people that actually like sh- when you go into New York City, uh, should you like pack a, a sleeping bag in the off chance that your train will uh, lose power and that you won't go anywhere? Well, yes, I, I get the feeling that power outage was kind of unexpected. Well, well no, the no, no, it's, it's of no it, doubt the power, the power <clears throat> outage is when the power line goes down and kills Mikey. Yeah, that's when the train loses power. Yes, that's the same electric yeah. pole that one assumes powers the train. But to answer Eric's question, now I'm I'm glad that he brought up this point because okay. it is important to understand the transportation dynamics at work here. Yes, you can get stranded on the train in the middle of the night. But all night, Be- will it take them all night to get you to uh, to uh, uh, to New Canaan? Yeah. It. Yeah. I, yeah. Like, like I know, literally. Yeah. I I know a few people. I have an online friend who lives in Southern Connecticut and works in New York City, and she does that every day. Yeah, that's and, that's a regular commute for a lot of people. Yeah. It's um, like it's like our, Connecticut our buddy, is the suburb of the Soleil, suburbs. Yeah, our buddy Soleil, yeah. who was on the podcast a few months ago, does that commute every day. He does that daily. Uh, lives so in, there's a in, chance that you could literally get on the train and not get off the train until the morning when you have to get back on the train to go back to work. Yeah. Well, you just stay wow. on it and just go. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. That's. I'm I be mean, li- so I'm be, and yesterday's closed, but hey, what the hell? Yeah. So you better show up at work. Yeah. Um The the whole the whole thing is yes that that can happen now now typically what you would do is. You would find a friend that lives in the city and just stay there for the night, knowing that the weather's crappy and knowing that there's yeah. a good chance that there are going to be delays with transportation. So, no, so these parents are actually even worse than we believe because right. they're saying so, you need to be on the yeah, last train. So they, they should have said, you know, unless the weather is bad, then stay put. They know that the weather's bad. They even mention it. It's like, yeah. don't Everybody forget, ignored it. I mean, they're still having a key party in this weather. Why would, wouldn't he get on a train? I think I think that I think that they're wanting them all to die. I, I'm, I'm starting yeah. to think that this is a death cult uh, yeah. that that we stumbled upon here. Hey, it's um, just a little excitement, nothing to worry about. A right? yuppie death cult, which is going to be the name of my <laughs> rock band. But all right, so yeah, no, I mean it, it. Like like we said, there are this this is like the encyclopedia of bad decisions, things that yeah. you should not do. Like log- logic would dictate that if the weather really is that bad, stay home. Don't right. go out on the roads. Don't try to take a train somewhere. Don't drunk. You're just dr- going to end up getting stranded. There was, um, this is not snow, but snow is. This is worse. This well, is ice. Ice, Black ice, ice is worse than snow, but sn- like ice will melt the next day. The snow, like the snow sticks around. We had um, actually just about two years ago today. Uh, or or this time of year, Western yeah. New York had a big blizzard, and so there were parts of the throughway, uh, which is the the big expressway that runs up uh, along along Lake Erie, Lake Erie uh, to Buffalo. So that part that stretch of road got seven feet of snow, and so there were cars on that road that did not get dug out for a week because like you just can't physically move 
that amount of snow. And if it's not melting, it's not going anywhere. But we don't say snow. It's all ice. It's all right. I'm I'm saying that like in terms like you don't have to deal with this because you're in the south. But like up up here in the north, uh, we like this is this is kind of a fact of life that the mm -hmm. that the weather does wreak havoc on um on transportation and it's not like now like you would say like in Houston you might have a big storm come through or you might have a hurricane that would come up you have some kind of notice like this is this was a rainstorm that turned to ice that was the like yeah. the variance of of 2 degrees that made the difference and that's really tough to predict in the general weather sense even a few hours ahead of time to say okay the temperature is going to drop just enough that this rain will freeze it won't turn into snow but it'll be rain that ends up freezing and turning into ice like that's really really tough to predict and and plan for and so even if the weatherman gets on the six o'clock news and says it's probably going to turn to ice tonight it may or it may not they're, they're just saying okay keep an eye out for it yeah yeah, but but either way though, even if it were if it were snow or ice, would they respond differently uh, in that particular sense? I mean, uh, yeah, it's it, snow, no problem. Snow, you're going to be out because no, yeah. the plows will be out, the salt trucks will be out, it'll be fine. Ice is a lot is a lot Crazier. tougher to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Snow, you can actually generate traction on snow, right? And that's that's self... a really good point. Yeah, and yeah. You can you can see when the road is snow covered. The uh, a wet road and an icy road looks very very similar and so you can be driving along on a nice road or or even a road that looks dry and you can hit black ice that you wouldn't even be able to see no, you don't yeah. hit black ice black ice hits you sorry i've speaking of some okay i've i've gone sideways at 50 miles an hour so often the last time it happened i had no adrenal rush that's crazy <laughs> you're you're like one of the characters in this movie who's just dead it's inside. Like, again? Like, oh well, I guess this is it. It was it's not even that. It's like again, well, I know how to correct this. And yeah. yeah. Right. So, just, since just we're talking about death, it. let's let's talk about Mikey's death. Um especially okay. uh how he dies and the ramifications killed of by death. molecules. Oh, well by he he kind of saw it coming, though. Yeah, I mean, he could have jumped off of that one before the pole hit. And it's like, because he's talking like he knows it's coming. I think that he I think he stayed there intentionally, to be uh, honest. Could be. I think he's I think he saw it coming and accepted he, his fate. He froze. He froze like he like not to play on the title of the movie, but he literally froze like yeah. he saw it. And he went, oh, no, that's not good. And I think he realized at the last second that the guardrail was connected and it's metal. And it's not again, he wasn't grounded. a good science student. No, no, no. Definitely <laughs> you, you, you get away from things that are metal when you see an arcing power line for yeah. sure. Um, but he froze and he, he stayed there and, and that zapped him. Now, in fairness, he almost died like five times yeah. before I mean, that. Like the like, tap dancing I, on the, oh the, the, the tap I dancing. He, I thought he was going to die before. there. Oh, for sure. Um, like, like who does? Who could losing, losing down the middle of the <laughs> now, road. Now that looked like fun, <laughs> except if any oh, other yeah. car showed up, he I could see his dad running him over. He I, if he die. assumes that nobody's on the road because of the ice, I could. Well, I, my my group of friends would have done shit like that back in the so, back in the so early nineties if we people, knew nobody was around. Yes, but we'd you, be looking assume, out too, going. You assume. Yep. Don't see that, any headlights. We're good. Go. You assume <laughs> that that it, no one will be on the road because of the ice. But yeah. Anyone on the road is going to no kill control, you. Has yeah. no control, and it's not like they're going to see you and just swerve out of the way. Nope. You're. You're. That's it. I'm, I'm surprised Kevin Klein's character stopped at the end of the film and didn't like lose control and smack into him in the well, down lines. And, and I think he realized, like <laughs> he like you saw him weigh his options, like do I get back in the car or do I just carry him? And he decides just to carry him carry because him, he knows, right. like he sh he knows he should not be on the road 
anyway. And if he tries, if he tries to drive somewhere at speed to get him home or to a hospital or something, he's just going to end wreck. up killing killing both yeah. of them. But Mikey's already dead. Mikey was yeah. dead pretty much before he hit the ground. And yeah. that's... I, I think the the aspect of his death that really haunted me was the fact that after he had died, he just slid all the way down. Oh yeah, he, he kept sliding. Yeah. Down. You know, he's just and I and I also find it very interesting. There, there's an aspect to this I also liked was the fact that he was in the red jumper, um, which um, first off it helps, especially with it being a night shoot, uh, to be able to differentiate him. Another thing I found, it's a small little detail in the film, but I, I found it actually very fascinating, is when he leaves his house um, and you see him go through the window that's been iced over. So he looks like this red spot uh, that is fading um, from, the, uh, from the window. And again, especially because at this particular point, you know that something really bad is about to happen to him, right? Because he's leaving on his own. Um, something's gonna happen, right? It's, it's it's kind of like almost like a rule of of uh, art house films. It's like if if you go out on your own during terrible weather and you wear something red, you're dead, right? Yeah. Red shirt. <laughs> okay. Red parka. Yeah. Start free to shoot parka. Dead. Okay. But. No, I just, but I do find it interesting. I also, again, I, I, I love uh, Jamie Sheridan uh, when uh, when Kevin Klein brings uh, Mikey's uh, dead body back. And I, I love the delayed response of the entire family when Sigourney Weaver comes and she sees, um, and then, of course, uh, the younger boy, and how uh, Christina Ricci reaches out to him right yeah it's like i don't know just there's a connection right there there's this is connecting these two families they can't just ignore this they're not going to be able to deny each other over what happened because this connects them this brings them together It, it fuses them together right this death um is is cathartic in a way, right? It it it's is, and one. I think also it isn't because. What do you think the next few days or weeks are going to be like for these families? Knowing knowing what's already gone between all of them, I don't think that they're going to get to back together. There's not going to be family picnics between the two, but they're going to recognize each other. They're yeah. going to have to. They're going to have. I mean, they're not. One's not going to move away, right? Oh, you don't think so? No. Do you think the divorce the divorce is going to happen? The I day? don't think so because uh, yeah. the reason why I don't think so is because of how Joan Allen uh, goes into the bathroom with Kevin Klein. I think she understands that he's lonely. I think that she truly does understand. Yeah, but I she leaves him there. She le- <laughs> she no, leaves him there. She leaves him there because she needs time. Uh, she needs time yeah. away from him. Yeah, but and she goes cathartic. home with she Jamie says, we'll Sheridan. Talk in the morning. And she isn't saying that, like, we'll talk in the morning, like, you know, prepare for divorce court. I think it's, look, I understand. She, she that, that really pitiful sex scene made her realize that... And I don't want to say that this is all about her not being able to get better than Kevin Klein, but I think that in a way she realizes just how lonely that she is and how lonely he is and that she is the one that's going to be able to – she's going to have to be the one that, 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 that brings this together. She's going to have to uh, open up because the one thing that he can't do is open up to her because every time he does, she moves away from him. We see it when he tries to snuggle up to her, even when they're having sex. It's yeah, like, so oh, let's just get it over with. Yeah. yeah, that's why I don't see I don't see anyone in this movie moving closer together with the possible exception of Christina Ricci and the she, younger brother. Like I could almost see she, that no, the, the, he's going to see her as, as the death of her of his brother. And, and that's uh, I completely see why? the opposite. I don't think so. 
What? Yeah, why? She had nothing to do with his Look death. at his face when she's hugging him. He's associating her with no, his I think brother. he's I think he's associating her with comfort in this moment. Yeah. Like he cries, but he cries because his brother's dead, not because she had anything to do with him. They both they both let him go out into the storm. Um well, she wasn't not, there when he went out. But look at but but remember how he responded with the whole uh, "you show me yours and I show you mine." She fulfilled her part, and when he felt the pressure, he associated her with that antagonism. It, it's, it's something that that we see over and over with him. You, he if he confronts something that is painful, especially if someone is proactive. He immediately takes a defensive posture. Yeah, but it doesn't stick. I mean, she they get he gets in bed with her. Like you know what I mean? Like yeah. like I, I could see your point if that was like she he didn't have anything to do with her the rest of the because movie. He, but because they they clearly move past that and I think they're gonna move past this. And what, what I think is kinda interesting is so right now, I guess from the script perspective they're a year apart in in age, right? No, they're the same age. The same no, age. No, wait, the... wait, well, no. who are you talking no. about? Toby McGraw? Chris... No, no, Christina uh, Ricci Ray... and the, the younger brother. The younger brother, the they're the same age. They're, they're the same supposed age to be in the, 14. In the script. Yeah. They were and supposed I think to that... be, but the, the, the way that they, they yeah. started off was that she yeah, the way... is the same age as uh, Elijah Wood. Yeah, yeah. but and he's so there's supposed a, to be 15. There's a... They may be in the same grade. Right. And he's they older. Could be... They could be. Because that does happen. At most, what, two years different in age mm, I don't I at most I think they're in the same grade yeah at least but I my so my point is but. that that's a big difference when you're in middle school being like a grade or two different or a year or two different or even if you're in the same grade but when you're older when you're 18 19 doesn't really make much difference right like I think that you'll see them if anything be kind of what holds the two families together. I don't think it's going to be any of the relationships with the parents. And to quote a cliche, I think they'll stay together for the kids. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, again, it's one of those things I think it leaves on a quandary. Um, another reason why... Well, right. I mean, we, like, we won't see because that's the end of the movie. We don't <laughs> well, no, really no, know. Because, because book. they pick up Tobey Maguire and then Kevin Klein has a breakdown. And yeah. watch how... Uh, Joan Allen responds to that. She doesn't respond by being distant. She actually comforts him. She brings comfort to him. Again, it's a, it's showing that she's yeah, and again in to... in front of the kids. I think that's but she doesn't kind of look at important... the kids. She looks at him. Her concern is only him because she doesn't look back at the kids. She doesn't show it. Doesn't show that she is connecting the kids to her actions. The film doesn't. Uh, put that because it puts them in a two shot there's no showing of the kids in fact if i'm not correct it shows it from uh from uh uh, uh, uh the shoulder of uh kevin klein's uh perspective so again it it, uh, it connects that it's just about these two they're connecting now whether or not that stays true to you know uh, forever ever who knows i don't think so because again they'll get bored but at this particular point, she is finally connecting to him. She's finally accepting that she is uh, she needs to uh, actively uh, take part in connecting with her husband because he needs her, and she's realized that, and she realizes that she needs him. And you say what you will about it being about gender roles and stuff like that, but this has left some sort of this has left a bit of catharsis. And that's something that I really appreciate what this film does. It doesn't mean that this will be forever. But at this particular point, at this, this crisis point, uh, they're showing that they're wanting to work. They're wanting to uh, move forward and not just break up. And, well, and, yeah. and you have to come at it, too, from the perspective that Tobey Maguire has no idea what yeah. has just transpired. Like, but we're not seeing like it from is, pers his perspective. Well, I think it I think we we are and we aren't because if you look at the movie if you look at the movie framed by seeing Tobey <laughs> Maguire get off the train 
and we don't know what's happened, then we find out everything that's happened, and then we see Tobey Maguire get off the train again, and we do know what's happened. But we don't so see think, the crying uh, uh, at the beginning. Right, we, we see don't see the crying because the we don't know. Says, we if, don't know what's happened. But yes, now but, we know, but he still doesn't know. So we can still take that framing device that we had at the beginning of the film. We can still take that moment and say, all right, this is where we're at. Everything that happens from this moment on is is an unknown. We we don't know what visual how they're going to show that, though. What, what, what where is the indication that, that, that that's the problem here? Is that what we're, it's we're not assuming. a problem at all. We have we have the framing device at the beginning, knowing that this is where the story starts. And then we go back and flashback and then we catch up to present time. And Toby Maguire has no idea what has happened. He knows nothing about the key party. He knows nothing about the ice storm other okay, than it does, he have, his does train. he have voiceover at the end of the film? No, but it, the voiceover at the beginning is about well yeah he he kind of does have a little bit more on the train at the end right doesn't he, he talk more about um the fantastic, fantastic Four? Four is a little yeah 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 he goes back into that um monologue that he was doing but then so this is this is kind of like the interesting thing uh, actually of, no he, do, he doesn't have voice over what it is is that the film shows him looking at the fantastic Four, and you see that the wap uh where the uh again uh kind of Bringing back yeah, the, the death. Yeah, the well, it. not death, but like um, the dealing with Franklin Richards, right? Is is mm -hmm. the story, and and so the parents have to, I guess, they erase his mind or something. But um, but that's really that's really kind of I think crucial is that you take you bring his character back into it, being kind of the he knows nothing of of what happens. He doesn't know that Mikey has died. He doesn't know really anything that's happened. In this intervening period, he's been on his own stuff, which has been busy enough. Yeah. But you're kind of um, now coming back into it, and that's where the film leaves off. Is where, like, where does it go from here? But he has no idea now why his father is crying in the car. Yeah, there's he no just knows or or any kind of signifier. So I, I I'm, I'm going to disagree on this. But, but what are you disagreeing with? Because I don't think you're understanding it's not, my point. It, this isn't from Tobey Maguire's perspective. This is uh, all. This is is that uh, this is sh uh, again the the framing pers uh, the framing device is to show how uh, what caused this particular uh, train to be stopped. If, if you want to look at it from uh, Maguire's perspective, the rest of this is the connection between the parents and the children. It, there, there's in that this, this Tobey Maguire is a part of that story, but it isn't specifically about him. Otherwise, we so wouldn't when he, have so when, they're, so when they're in the car, he has no idea why his father is crying, right? Yes. Well, no. none of them do, because it's none more than just the death of of Mikey. It's everything that has happened. This has been a traumatic night for him. You know the, the 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 you know that started off with uh, the you know finding his daughter dry humping Elijah Wood, and then and then finding dead then, Elijah Wood. Well, yeah. well, well, you, you're all but the fact that he was uh, caught with his cheating and then uh, left to his own uh, to to his own imagination what his wife was doing, and realizing. Uh, the pain that he has caused himself and caused her uh, and the pity that uh, also came with that. And then of course, finding the dead child of the man whose wife he's been stooping. Uh, again, this is, it's been traumatic. This is, he's gone through a lot and she's realized this and she, and I think that that's the thing is that this isn't just Toby McGuire's story. This is all of their stories. It all culminates. We're seeing it from all of their perspective. And that includes uh, Kevin Kline's and Joan Allen's and Christina Ricci. And for him, when he breaks down, this is a moment between him and his wife. You don't think it's the relief at seeing his own son alive and well? Oh, no, no, no. I, don't, I think that's stopping him from crying more. It's like... Okay. I, <coughs> 
All right, I, I'm going to go I'm going to go with my reading of this scene, which is that this is about a family being reunited in and I agree with you in the in the wake of a very traumatic night for everyone involved. And I think that that kind of like the the coming together that you have at the film, I think it's very important that at the end of the film, you have everyone together in the car. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. I think if you look at this film, if you said, which, which film is the center of the story? Is it the hoods or is it the Carvers? Well, it's, it's uh, obviously the hoods because hoods. we focus mostly on all four of those characters. Those are the four that, you know, uh, when, uh, and when, yet which family goes through more upheaval? Ooh, well, all of them. Well, I mean, obviously well, you know, as a child that pretty much trumps that everything. Right. Yeah. 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 <coughs> that's, that's uh. kind of, that's kind of my point is that, so you have, obviously the Carvers have gone through, um, a lot, right? Like, yeah. Like there's guilt. There's going to be feelings of guilt. There's going to be feelings of betrayal. They've like both spouses have now cheated on each other. Um, the 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 boy, the younger boy, I guess slept with. Um, no, the, they just the girl. got naked and they, fell asleep. Yes, slept. Yeah. That's why I said slept with. They slept oh. together. Um, the the girl that was uh, seeing his brother uh, while his brother was out dying. And, you know, after he let him go out into the storm. And so I feel like they're going to have a lot more to kind of deal with than the hoods. It doesn't seem like the hoods were broken fundamentally at the beginning of the film. Look at the Thanksgiving scene when they're all together and they're like, wow, this is really a lot better now that we don't have you know, screaming uncle, whatever, and, and everything else. Like now there's just the four of us. No, this no, is no, really, that's Kevin this Klein, is really kind of nice. Playing, he's flipping. I mean, the thing is, is that he, he's sarcastic as we see when he calls up, uh, uh, Toby McGuire early, you know, it's like, you know, the whole idea of you, all the kids here to eat. And we actually kind of like it when y'all do that. Uh, again, that, that's him, uh, trying to be, uh, trying to be hip dad. That's him trying to, um, kind of uh, shrug off his own insecurities that that's how he does it he does yeah. it by joking no, I agree. Uh, dad jokes i mean i mm. and i and i and i like that but it does they never with the exception i think of the parents they never show a fundamental crack in the family structure obviously toby mcguire and christina ricci get along very well they have pet oh, names yeah. for each other um, well, it's th- the same name, Charles. <clears throat> yeah, right. there's there's an absence I think felt when Toby Maguire is away and Christina Ricci is kind of like there. She's like there by herself. Um, no, no wonder she. Well, when, when she has to deal with those away. parents by herself. The parental units. Yeah, 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 yeah. They they wanna they wanna play catch up. So I I think I think it's interesting just kind of in summation to look at the the core family and the core family dynamic in the movie but it's not necessarily who who is dealt the harshest blow it's kind of just seeing seeing how they deal with that is that going to destroy them or make them stronger and i agree completely on that um and i think that their that their pain is different and that's another thing i like about this we're not comparing pains between hoods and carvers they they're going through their own problems. I mean, like like when Sigourney Weaver comes home after being taken home by her date, right. I mean, what she does, she curls up in her bed, fetally, you know, lonely, distraught. She, you know, for the for the rest of the film, all that we see her is this strong, sexually liberated, independent woman. You know, she's you know. I mean, she, she's the, the, the definition of a, of, you know, of a feminist wife, you know, that, you know, she's going to take what she wants. You know, she's a Samantha, you know, if we're going to go sex in the city. And then at the end of the day, she can't look at her son and she curls up into bed in a fetal position, lonely and distraught. Yeah. And she we never see her like she doesn't know that her Sigourney Weaver, we don't know. She doesn't know that her son is dead. No. When we see that final she's shot. Lonely. She, she's lonely. She's lying in bed and she wakes up to the anguished cries and she just kind of lies there. 
Yeah. Well, she, I mean, the, what, what, what do you expect? I mean, because she's not, she puts on a strong face, but she is not strong. She is weak. All of these characters are weak in some manner. In fact, I'd say the strongest two characters are Tobey Maguire and Joan Allen. Because uh, Joan Allen ha- is put through a lot. And she still has the strength to, to forgive. She still has the strength to uh, unite her family and to uh, be the mother, or be a mother to uh, her daughter and to her son. Uh, she, sh- you know, she shows a strength that none of the other characters in her family, besides her son, has. Right, and her son has exceeded that when he, uh, uh, when, when he. Uh, when, when, when he uh, faces temptation and finds the strength to, uh, you know, to be a to, decent right human thing. being. Well, yeah. Believe it or not, being a decent human being takes strength. It, it might not be something that we that, that that people you know we should get cookies for or be complimented for. But yeah, the, the minimal strength. amount of human decency. You're totally right. Well, no. I mean, <sighs> again, it's a lot easier to destroy than to build. It's a lot easier to to give into a base desire than to say, "No, I'm going to do the right thing." I mean, that's why we that's why we celebrate people who do the right thing to face uh, to, to face the thing that we absolutely want and be able to say, "I'm better than this." Again, I'm not saying that you should get a cookie for it, but I mean, he also. Like you said, I think he also kind of just abandons them there. And when, like, we hope that they're okay, but we don't ever see him check for a pulse. But is he doing it because because he's scared, or is he doing it because he thinks that they're okay? If he thinks that they're okay, uh, whether they're okay or not, and again, I'm not saying that he's smart. No, I think think that he's scared and and wants to get out of there and not miss his curfew. Well, I think well, I think he's scared about missing the curfew more than he's scared yeah. about what happened in that apartment. But again, it's it, the the reason is important, and you know the fact that you know he he starts running when he see when he looks at the, his watch, is that that indicates that it's the time that he's concerned about. It's but not. I I don't think he would have been as concerned about the time if she had stayed conscious and. A willing they partner. Were talking. Yeah. I don't know. You uh, know what I mean? Like I, I think that he would have. That's a hypothetical. His, I think he would have made something up. He would have come up with some excuse. Perhaps. Not to go oh home. no, I couldn't make it to the station because yeah. the, oh, the rain. Yeah, hey, yeah. Hey, baby, it's uh, cold I'm just outside. Gonna, I'm just going to stay here in the yeah. city where it's safe. And yeah, Which, there was something yeah. in that drink. Sorry, I, I yeah. it's to. cold outside. All right, folks. We're getting long. All right, but before I have one more question before we oh, call cool. it, uh, because this came out in 1997. A few movies came out that year. <laughs> there uh, was a lot going has, on. Yeah, 1997 was one of the best years in cinema. I'll, I'll be honest. It was here. almost 1999. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, but uh, we, you know, Titanic, L.A. Confidential, The Full Monty, Goodwill Hunting. I believe as good as it gets came out around this time too all the star wars uh, special editions uh do we really want to put that in okay <laughs> well yeah for, wife and i's first date empire Strikes Back came edition. out this uh, year as well if you really yeah. want to go there we don't yeah. have to mention um, everything but yeah yeah but uh, but but let's be honest here the, the those movies i just mentioned with the exception of anaconda all went on to win lots of uh awards yeah. and all of them were nominated for best picture uh the ice storm was Basically denied. Uh, Sigourney Weaver got a, a Golden Globe nomination. That was pretty much it. Do you think that the, the film deserved better? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think Sigourney Weaver's was the standout performance in the film either. So the fact that she no, ended up Joan with the, Yeah, the fact yeah. that she ended up with the nod for the Golden Globe, I don't really... Joan Allen's really... been denied Academy Award nomination so many times they should just basically call it the Joan Allen should be the Academy Award nominee so award. She's like the uh, uh, what's her name from the a- daytime Emmys. Uh, Susan Lucci. She's almost Susan Lucci. Yeah. <laughs> we could almost make a DiCaprio joke, but we can't anymore. Damn you, Revenant. Yeah. Make an a- Amy Adams joke. There you go. Hey, ironically, I, Titanic. I, I think uh, it's a shame that this film didn't get more recognition. Not only because you. Like you mentioned, you mentioned all those films, and I guess Titanic, LA Confidential, 
their period pieces. This I think fits in with what some of the awesome period pieces that were made in 97. I don't, and I think it's culturally relevant to the nineties in a way that probably Titanic, I don't think really was. And it fit so well within kind of what was going on in that time period that I think it's kind of a bummer that more people haven't seen this movie. And that's why I want to, I want to start a campaign to make this one of the go-to Thanksgiving <laughs> movies, almost like a Christmas story has become. on Christmas Day. You get 24 hours of a Christmas story. Let's do 24 hours of the ice storm. How awesome would that be? I would be so much more for 24 hours of a Christmas story over 24 hours of a Christmas story. No, you yep. are right there. You are, you are so. You are so <laughs> I, I definitely think that this film deserves more attention. Definitely deserves better. But I, I get yeah. that there are there are are lean years and there are fat years in cinema. And ninety seven was a fat year. If this is ninety eight, I, you know, I think it might have. I think it might have hit a little bit better. It would have been later. What you mean, the Shakespeare whole, and Love and Saving Private Ryan? Yeah, but it would have been later into the Clinton years. It would have been, I think, more culturally relevant maybe at that point. No, it should have been um, 96 I could, because I would then I'll definitely have to deal with the English this, patient. I would de- which, which year? 96. 96, yeah. Oh, for sure. I would I would even give this the edge over Shakespeare in Love for a Best Picture nod. Like, I think if that was your choice, uh, I don't know. No, I, the Ice Storm, I think, honestly, should deserve better. I The thing was is that when I saw it in theaters, I, I, I had a hard time really watching it. It was it was painful, you know, for a teenager. Um, on top of that, uh, I had mixed feelings about uh, 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 about uh, Christina Ricci, who, you know, well, yeah, I, I kind of had a thing for her. Um, wait, 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 you had mixed feelings for her, or you just had feelings for her? Well, you're seeing her, you know, doing things. That... Yeah, she's not a lovable character in this. No, uh, yeah, well, we'll, we'll leave it at that. She's um, a bad but... girl. She shoplifts. She, you know, plays messes around. She's wears a Nixon mask. She doesn't mm-hmm. like Nixon though, which I, I'll give her credit for that. Yep, yeah, that Nixon mask was just yeah, not, not exactly that's Nixon that's fan. gonna <laughs> scar some people. So. <laughs> Um, I want to point out the similarity between her Thanksgiving toast in this and Wednesday Adams Thanksgiving speech. Yes. And fa- oh, by the uh, way, Adam's and, Family uh, Values. Yes, in Adam's Family Values, she was also hooking up with a certain David Crumholtz. What? Mm. Yeah. And yeah. how about that? Katie Holmes and Toby McGuire took class again uh-huh. in uh, Wonder Boys. Wonder Boys. Yep. Joan yeah. Allen and Kevin Klein. Joan, Joan Allen. No, not, not, I'm sorry. Kevin Klein and Toby McGuire. Weaver were in Dave. Yep. Uh, they were um, married. And... Toby McGuire, Joan Allen in Pleasantville, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joan Allen, Toby McGuire in Pleasantville, which came out the new year after and one of my all time favorite films. Uh, let's see here. I want to say that there's a few other uh, hookups uh, that uh, occurred in. I... Oh, uh, yeah. I Katie... mean, what's what's kind of fun Is about it Katie this Holmes movie? Katie Holmes also in the faculty. I, I want to say that Katie Holmes was Ooh, in the faculty. I think Wednesday. that's good. That's a good one. That might be. Yeah. No. So this is this is kind of like I said. This is fun in that you have established character actors that have been in film for a long time with kind of like the next generation of mm-hmm. same, which is which is really kind of fun in this film. Definitely, you see David Crumholtz show up in a lot of stuff. I know oh. we've. I think we've mentioned him before. Mm-hmm in something else and i and i had a thought which was what, David somehow Combs? somehow i wanted uh in like my head my head canon toby mcguire uh or no elijah wood's character like new rudy or something i don't know why i put that together in my yeah. head but i don't think the timeline works yeah. by the way uh just to let you know toby mcguire and angley actually worked together on angley's next film which was ride with the devil um, which is a great Western of sorts. 
uh, that also had uh, it was my introduction to Jonathan Rhys Myers and Jeffrey Wright, uh, one of the greatest actors of all time, in my opinion. Yeah, I said it. Um, Maybe a discussion for another time. Let's definitely yeah call all right. this one. So uh. let's let's first off let's set the table. We've got our turkey. We've got our stuffing, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. I don't know how you feel about Brussels sprouts, maybe some green bean casserole. I don't know if you're a biscuit or a crescent roll family, but let's let's sit down together. Are you thankful for having seen the ice storm? Kent. Ooh, am I thankful? Ah, uh, I've been having trouble trying to decide what I was going to do with this movie because it is it's actually very com- a lot more complicated uh, i did two watchings of it and the second one it did show that it was way more complicated than i originally gave it on the first go through uh I was able to pay more attention to the, some of the weird symbolism going on like see every time they cracked ice throughout it's like yes, oh, that's, yeah that's, you do that's have a recurring ice thing. ice yeah, yeah. ice motif before Good it symbolism. even gets to the storm and i for uh this was angley's first what america. time in america so yeah well, I, no, he no, did I mean, very he, he did uh, <clears throat> the wedding banquet was set in manhattan but it was a uh, foreign language film yeah but I mean, so it's his, his first, first American, American English language. Uh, yeah. He's going for an American. Where he had audience. done an English language film, but it was Sense and Sensibility, so it was technically, I guess, British. But yeah. right, which is foreign because we're America. Uh, no, just well, yeah. Uh, so I'm, 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 am tearing. It's not a fail. I'm <laughs> saying that right now. Not a fail. We got too much star power here. It is definitely a sit down and pay attention to it yeah. movie it is not a put it on the background and have fun and with your friends and uh well we're heading to no, the tea party metaphor there yeah this is not that and it probably also doesn't work as a date fever now that we uh, no. mentioned that no this is, uh <laughs> this is like said, you're steeped in a relationship yeah this is a this is a warning in many ways. Uh, don't go to key parties and leave your kids people. home in an ice storm uh, where they could wander off. Uh, I am going to go ahead and give this a pass because I get the feeling I'm going to be recommending this to somebody. I'm not sure who exactly, but I'll be at some point going, "Say, have you seen the ice storm?" And just saying, "Yeah, this would be this is the kind of movie that I bet." so and so do I can mm-hmm. I I think that's where I'm going with this so right. yeah Lobster. it's passing all right it's a pass from Kent it's gonna be a pass from me as well okay. so I I'm the one who kind of pushed for doing this movie yeah. I wanted to do a Thanksgiving movie that was maybe a little bit different and this I think definitely qualifies but you got to give this movie credit it does make you think about your blessings and be thankful for the stability in your life, the, or the things that are stable in your life. And, and certainly you can, you can look at whatever economic situation you have going on, whatever family situation you have going on, whatever's going on. It's not as messed up as these people, because these people literally have everything. They are not, Uh, They're not suffering. They are not out on the street. They are not, um, you know, visibly uh, sick in any way. But they are inflicting destruction and and self-destruction on themselves and each other. And it really kind of makes you stop and think. And I know this movie was or the, the novel, at least, by the author was written uh, as an F you to his own upbringing and his own own parents. And I understand that after he watched it, he wept through the closing credits at seeing his vision realized. And, and I know that I think that um, they actually did some softening 
too to make the parents a little bit more sympathetic in the film but mm. i i feel like they really they really nailed the like the 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 harshness and the and the the self destruction aspect of this thing and and the opening monologue i love about the fantastic four and and they're their own worst enemies right like cuz no one can hurt them as much as they can hurt each other and i think that that's really really true in the case of this film if this was a film about outside forces threatening to tear these families apart or or outside forces uh, doing doing harm to them or seeking to do harm to them, then you would see them come together and, and be strong. But but the, the forces are within. We've seen the enemy, and the enemy is us. And I think that is such a brilliant angle that this movie takes and, and brilliantly executed in terms of the pacing, the way the film is shot, the way the film the way the lines are delivered and the, and the way that, that everything kind of comes together really, really deserves a pass and, and shows why, even at this kind of early stage in his career, Ang Lee is a force to reckon with in cinema. So I think any language, I think Ang Lee is one of the, the directors that can make a movie in any language that he understands, can make a, a movie in really any environment and make make it compelling and watchable and i think one you're going to see at some point a channel is going to start showing this 24 hours a day <laughs> on thanksgiving just to be the channel yeah, that the does Sunday's it channel yeah, yeah sure right but like you're you're counter programming at its finest right here so pass on the ice storm I own this movie, so I guess that should say a lot about what I think about this movie. I am a huge Ang Lee fan, and this film is my first Ang Lee film. I this movie made me uncomfortable the first time I saw it, and but it was that kind of uncomfort, the discomfort that you feel when you see something that truly hits home. And then, like I said, there are other films that try to get these the same type of characters to and get you to care about them. But the thing is, is that they, the narcissism that usually accompanies these types of characters uh, is meant that, that we're just supposed to care for them just because they're human beings. And here, it, it allows us to find their humanity while also con condemning the bad behaviors that they have. It doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't let them off the hook. We're not ever supposed to uh, forgive them entirely for what they've done. They have to forgive themselves and they have to forgive each other. And so that's what I love about what this film really does. And I think that this is a film that's been overshadowed uh, by general audiences just because it's so uncomfortable. And yet at the same time, I think that there is something hopeful about this, that there is a light at the end of the dawn, that you know, the family will be there uh, after a night in a frozen, you know, a frozen train car. It, the, there is something more to this film, and that I think that as time gets, gives it more credence, and especially the Criterion Collection, uh, making it a part of that selection. By the way, uh, it is half off at Barnes & Noble for the rest of November 2016. Okay. Uh, so if you get a chance, I would strongly advise picking it up. Uh, because it, there is a lot of good stuff here. And yes, I, I love this film. It's not my favorite Ang Lee, but then again, I, I have a hard time picking my favorite Ang Lee at times. Uh, he, he just jumps all over the place. He never makes the same movie twice. And so I, I, I love that he gives us this glimpse of American life and then he'll go and do a Western and then he'll go and do a, a Chinese Kung Fu film. And then he'll go and do, uh, oh. uh, you know, a yeah. movie about cow, you know, gay cowboys. Uh, you know, he's capable of getting us to completely give into his characters and to see them for both what they do right and what they do wrong their strengths and their weaknesses and that's why i almost always recommend an angley film uh whether it be eat drink man woman which in my opinion is one of the most delightful films i've ever seen in my entire life 
or something as dark and dour as lost caution, uh, lust caution, or something that leaves you feeling kind of ambivalent or not even ambivalent, but just kind of makes you question things like Billy Lynn's long halftime walk or uh, perhaps even Brokeback Mountain. Uh, there's a lot that he does and, and films that just make you really just get you there. But The Ice Storm, I think, is possibly his most darkest vision. And that's saying a lot because Lost Caution is... Yeah, but I, I think that he's also giving us a ray of hope, and I think that we should embrace that ray of hope uh, that, that, that you know that, that he gives in his films, uh, even in Hulk, which I know that a lot of people don't like. But one thing that actually made me, and, and I'm going to go on for a little tangent here, <laughs> uh, is that uh, I, I found out that James Seamus, uh, who wrote this movie as well as Hulk, uh, made Hulk as uh, was not meant to be uh, seen in the realm of the Marvel uh, superheroes because they were actually making it before Spider-Man, but was actually trying to do it in the realm of the Universal monster movies. Hmm. And when I think about that, and then I go back and see it that way, it makes perfect sense, and it's a lot better film um, when you see it in that particular uh, light. Now, again, if you're a purist, then you know you definitely will hate it, but for me, I, I, I think it's brilliant, and yeah, but Ice Storm, absolute pass, great direction, great cast, great writing. I love this film. Watch it. Watch it for Thanksgiving. Watch it after Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving, you know, just make sure that you're in a happy place. All right, so we are now done with Thanksgiving, and it's now time to get into the holidays proper. I don't know about you, but I feel like we need a new partner. Huh? I have to say <coughs> that that makes sense because I am getting too old for this stuff. You know, this just stuff? before retirement, that's always a bad sign. You shouldn't go out into an ice storm right before you retire or no. into a hail of bullets right before you retire. Absolutely not. And yeah. you know what? We have a loaded or a lethal weapon in our holster that we will be pulling out with, I believe, a special guest. Yes. So please join us for that wonderful discussion that we have lined up. And I believe the rest of our December is actually looking pretty awesome, too, if I may say so, because <coughs> after we're done with uh, Gip, with uh, Riggs and Murta, we've got Django and a particular hangman. Any idea so, what we're talking about? Uh, oh. Yeah, we're doing our Tarantino <laughs> twofer. So we are getting to the point of Art House Legends where we're just going to start doing like multiple films from the same director at the same time, <laughs> especially when, although oddly we're not doing the two part Tarantino experience, yeah. not, we're yet. Not, doing, not, not yet, yet. Not uh, yet. Uh, but we're doing two films that I think connect actually quite well. Django Unchained and The Hateful Eight could not be more excited to wrap up. 2016 talking about these plus we have a few more films up our sleeves and a few more surprises up our sleeves that we will leave for you to unwrap around christmas time but a hint they all involve colin farrell well don't not all, all good surprises them, but... involve colin <laughs> farrell well you know if, if uh, from what i understand with certain sex tapes all right whoa hello hey yo Man, it's a good thing. Right, uh, right, it's right. a good thing home video creation didn't exist during the ice storm. Uh, Super Eight would have been bad enough, but you know. All right. All right, <laughs> all right. Okay, we ready to call it? Uh, it was cold. It and was the, icy. <laughs> there was a storm. It was. It was a dark and stormy <laughs> night. Well, that is true. Yeah. yeah. All right. This is the movie to Derek. And this is Kent. And this is John O'Lobster. And feed.